our topic of today is Nerva and the Atian LTM roaming, and we will dif- discover if it's a fairy tale or a reality or both. Uh, so today we have great line of, lines of speakers. Uh, we have Jens from Deutsche Telekom IoT. He is a senior product manager, and he has years of experience in telco industry. And he will give us an overview an overview on of DT's uh, Nerva and the Atian LTE deployment and what are the next steps and what is waiting for us in the future. And uh, Jan Willem will be joining Jens for this session, and he is the chief architect of Sodak. Uh, which Sodak is a world-friendly IoT product um, dev- product uh, solution provider, I would say. Uh, and he, I would say that he's an internet p- pioneer with years of experience in IoT. And he will give us his real-life experiences with IoT roaming and what what are there to do for us and what are the next steps and. It will be an exciting session. Good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Jens. Some of you uh, might know me already. I've been working for uh, Deutsche Telekom IoT for quite a while. Um, I've also been heavily involved in the initial deployments of MBIoT and LTM for the group, uh, together with many other colleagues. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, NBOT and LTM roaming. Uh, I heard that uh, our, our colleagues from IoT creators had the subtitle "Fairy Tale or Reality." So definitely, it's 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 not a fairy tale; it's reality. So that's the spoiler right at the start. So I'm just going to give you today give you an update on where we are with roaming, but also um, I'm not going to be telling you fairy tales when I say it's a reality. So I'm going to be really honest about what are the uh, the challenges we still need to face and what do we still need to need to put in place in order to have a perfect user experience in roaming. Uh, when, when I say user experience, of course, uh, what I mean by this, we, we were talking about devices, IoT devices that work perfectly well, um, and then the user will also be happy. Um, and in order to make this the case, I'll tell you what needs to be done. Uh, but beforehand, let's just uh, clarify one thing, which is really important. Um, sometimes I heard people saying that we only need roaming for mobile use cases. And for uh, things like NBRT, for example, where you have really small devices that are mostly stationary, perhaps, we don't really need roaming. At least that was what many people told us a few years ago. So the, the, we need roaming, of course, for mobile devices, for any tracker um, that, that's supposed to work. You, you can't just tell them it only works in Germany or Netherlands. It needs to work everywhere, and at least everywhere in Europe. But also for stationary devices, so devices that are deployed at one point and that they will stay there for the rest of their lifetime, for example, meters, as an example, I guess. They also need, uh, in most cases, they need roaming because the company that produces those devices, they want to ship those devices throughout Europe, even uh, outside of Europe, and they don't want to have a specific separate stock keeping unit for every single country that uh, the respective device will be deployed in. So they want to have one stock keeping unit, one one device that will work regardless of whether it's deployed in Sweden or Italy or uh, Bulgaria. Okay, so this is why, so roaming is not always a mobile thing, it's always talking about permanent roaming for, for IoT. So let's start, of course, with uh, with a big question, like where do we have roaming for NBOT? So can you see this properly? Because there's the Zoom screen in front of it. Can you see no, the no. full screen? You, you see the full screen. Okay, great. So this is our current, uh, NBOT service footprint. So um, this includes the, the countries where Deutsche Telekom has their own I- NBOT network. So with the dark magenta ones, and then the light magenta countries are are um, countries where we have roaming uh, agreements in place for with uh, with NBOT with other operators. NBLT networks. So we have nine own countries, 18 roaming countries, adding up to 27 countries. In, in addition to this, we do have several uh, multiple roaming agreements in several countries, which means that, that the device can use different roaming networks in one, dev- uh, one country, for example, in Germany or in Italy, for example. So, so when, when you don't have a connection with one particular network, uh, you can still use the other one. Um, for LTM, it's a little bit different. Uh, there are, as you know, there are fewer LTM networks in the world. Um, so those are the blue ones, of course. Then for, for NBRT, this is at least the last information that we have got from the GSMA. So we have three, um, actually four countries, uh, should, have, should have included T-Mobile US, 
four own countries and 19 roaming countries. So adding up to, to 22 different countries where you can roam. This is not this is not perfect yet. So searching back to NBLT, here you can you can say that we cover almost the whole of Europe. Uh, for LTM, we still need um, need some more roaming agreements. I guess this is pretty leading worldwide, though. I don't um, I don't think other operators, at least in Europe, have a, 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 like anything comparable. Uh, in in actual fact, and and Jan Willem can can comment on this a bit later. Uh, I think that even today, most people would still deploy multi-mode devices just to be on the safe side that if, if NBRT isn't available, that you can still switch to LTM or 2G. But on the other hand, we all know that 2G is declining. Uh, 3G has been switched off in many countries, including Germany, for example. 2G is as, at least deteriorating. So there's, as the networks become less dense and less powerful. So I think going forward, we'll um, we either have we'll either have single mode NBRT or LTM devices or multi mode devices. But but with those devices, I think you'll be able to roam very well. For um, for LTM, there's there's maybe one other thing. I mean, I, I can at least unofficially say, uh, in those countries where we do not have roaming agreements yet, your LTM device will still work. So for example, if you go to Brazil or um, or Mexico, the LTM device will still work, but we as Deutsche Telekom cannot guarantee that all the power saving features will work because only for those ones where we have roaming agreements, we did all the testing of all the of all the power saving features. So the data transmission in most countries will work because they are LTE roaming agreements, but um, but we cannot uh, like um, be made accountable for it that, that that it will completely work. The good thing about this, the good thing about NVLT and LTM roaming compared to, uh, for example, uh, LoRa One is that it's based on existing roaming mechanisms. So our team and, and other operators teams, we haven't invented roaming just for NVLT and LTM. We use the, the 2G, 3G, and particularly the LTE roaming frameworks that are existing. So it, it, uh, that's why roaming um, from, for NBRT actually worked from day one. What we are still, of course, doing as an operator uh, uh, community, we're still uh, trying to automate the, automate the billing and we're try, still trying to make sure that all the operators can monetize their networks with roaming. But the roaming technique itself is something that works really easily. Now, when I say it works really easily, um, let's, be, let's be a little bit more specific. What do we need to do that any device works in any country perfectly? What do we need to have in place? So are there are a couple of things. First one is we need a global uh, network coverage. Um, we need, of course, further countries. We're still waiting for some countries, for some operators to still roll out the NBLT and LTM networks. I think this will be the case and it will be, uh, will be, com will be completely seamless. Uh, what we need to also, what, what specifically developers, customers, companies need to have is also transparency about network availability. So I'm not just talking about the question of whether NBRT and LTM is available in a country in the first place. I'm also talking about whether, uh, where exactly do you, do you have coverage? So I'm talking about coverage maps. And GSMA has started to collect those coverage maps um, if you go, uh, if you look at the GSMA deployment map, which is easily be found in the internet, uh, you can you can you will see that they have links to many coverage maps. However, little caveat here: if, for example, if you are our customer and we provide you with NBRT connectivity, we cannot guarantee that those coverage maps in some foreign countries actually are are correct. Um, so, but but this is really, guys, this is really the same as for L, uh, 2G, 3G, LTE. Uh, not a single operator can can have accountability for for coverage quality in in foreign roaming countries. But I think it's getting better and better. The next thing is that every network uh, can serve devices with with up to date capabilities. So specifically release 13, 14. I think release 13, it's fair to say that it has been deployed in like all relevant features have been deployed in um, in, in the key markets. And we're now looking at deploying uh, release 14 features. Another thing which is really um, handy is that the GSMA, which is basically a group of operators, including us, we have prepared something called Mobile IoT Deployment Guide, NBRT and LTM Deployment Guide that informs 
operators and developers which features are the important ones. So which power saving features and um, which performance features are the are the important ones, and which ones um, is, are the ones that you can actually ignore. We're actually working on a on an update which should be out there hopefully still this year. The next thing is um, transparency about network features. So it's not enough if an operator like Deutsche Telekom in our nine countries um, makes sure that all their networks are up to date. You as our customer also would like to know uh, what about our roaming partners, which which uh, power saving features, for example, are active in foreign uh, countries. What what uh, what about in uh, Spain or in um, in the UK? So uh, again, here we as an operator community have got our, got ourselves together to create a, a big database, to actually a table of the network available network features and settings. So. This table does not yet include all the operators in the world that have deployed NVLT and LTM features, but we're pushing all of them to share, to publicly share their data. We'll take a look at that data in a minute. And the, the next two things, which are of course less, less immediate than network coverage and availability of features is whether your, uh, your devices, uh, your, your applications use the network properly. So for example, if you're in a, in a cell, you're, if your NVRT device is in a cell with other NVRT devices that do not behave properly, which means that they send too much data or receive too much data, then it will impact the performance of your, of your um, device. In the mobile phone world, this has been solved by, by operating systems of, of apps. So no app developer can shoot down our network or sabotage our network. In the RT world, there's no such thing as an, as an uh, operating system yet. So we really need to rely on the, yeah, on the responsibility of, of, of developers to, to, uh, to develop their devices in the proper way so that they don't uh, you know, ruin and, and harm the network. Um, so that's why the GSMA as well as Deutsche Telekom have um, available a lot of guidelines which which not only uh, save the network, but also make sure that your application works well. And finally, for those developers who have not sticked to um, uh, our, our, uh, our guidelines, we are, as you, as you might know, we are embedding no harm to network uh, mechanisms into chipsets. So we have, uh, we have together with uh, GSMA again, we have agreed a few years ago already on, on, on mechanisms to block radio modules uh, sending too much data. And there's uh, also a growing list of, uh, of, of module and chipset vendors who incorporate those mechanisms into their chipsets. Okay, now just a little bit of uh, details before, before I hand over to Jan Willem. So this is uh, on the right-hand side, this is a view on the GSMA website. So there's the link where you, where you can uh, find uh, more information about the relevant features on roaming. You can, um, you can see the, the deployment map, like where do we have, uh, where do we have networks? This is the most, most up-to-date, more up-to-date than our slides, of course. And the, the settings uh, as, that I've just mentioned for L, L, LTM and NBRT, this list is steadily growing. The, if you, I'm, I'm not gonna go through this tale, but this is, this is more or less how it looks like. This is, how, this is uh, populated with the data of Deutsche Telekom networks. So uh, we have, uh, so you, you can see the different features. And so we, we, we indicate whether a feature is available or not and which, which are the parameter settings. And finally, uh, we as the Telecom, of course, we know that it's extremely important to provide information and to share information with developers because there's still so much to learn for everybody, including us. So in addition to all the good, um, good stuff that's out there on IoT creators, we have some further information on, 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 on our roaming footprint and, and tariffs on our corporate website. We have specifically on our hardware subpage, we have the specific uh, links to our national coverage maps of our networks where you can really zoom in street by street, house by house and check whether there's coverage. And we have um, something called, and, and I hope that all of you already know it, something called the IoT solution optimizer, which we have made for free uh, for any developer in the world. So you can actually simulate your IoT 
end-to-end -end solutions. You can simulate your devices. Um, you can configure a digital twin of your device. You can check how it will perform on what networks. We have several networks simulated here, not just the telecom networks, but others as well. And you can simulate your, your battery performance, your battery lifetime, and get some optimization recommendations. And this only works because we it's based on a large ecosystem of, of vendors um, who are who submitted us their specifications. So we can really simulate a lot of different different components here. So summing up, IoT roaming, NBOT, LTM roaming works pretty well. I can assure you that I would say really that most of our customers are, are super happy. Um, we don't we don't come across a lot of issues recently. They um, I think it seems that the most diff, the most important teething problems have been fixed so far. Um, the, so, so, you, so you can safely deploy your NBRT and LTM devices abroad as well. But on the other hand, and which was um, what I was talking about for the last 10 minutes, there's still optimization potential. It will still will still be working hard to make um, the user experience even better. So thanks very much. I'll hand over to Jan Willem. Great. And I'm looking forward to your questions. But first, Jan Willem. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Jens, for uh, for your presentation. I hope everyone can see my screen. It should read Sodak World Friendly IoT. Yes, we can see it. Good. Well, Sodak. Sodak is the company that I work for. Just a, a, a quick introduction. My name is Jan Willem Smeek. I've I've been an internet pioneer basically all my working life. Um, with uh, just a friend of mine, the two of us, we invented and starting Booking.com. I was sent to uh, Tanzania to hook up the whole country to the internet in the early 1990s. And in those days, we started uh, deploying low energy solar powered uh, weather stations. And that was the beginning of IoT, in my opinion, even before the, uh, the world uh, existed. Um, after living in Africa for uh, many years, I returned to Europe and uh, uh, settled in Holland. And that's where we started uh, Sodak as a company. Now, about Sodak, what, what we want, we call ourselves a world-friendly company. So what we want to do is we want to contribute to a better world by leading the new wave of uh, world-friendly IoT. And world-friendly, we mean uh, these uh, should be devices that uh, have a, a small uh, carbon footprint that are energy efficient, probably don't even use batteries. Uh, those are the kind of things that uh, we think we all should be created. So our mission is to make these world-friendly IoT products, and uh, we, are, we are mainly focusing on uh, uh, sensing and, uh, and tracking solutions, and the supply chain is a very important uh, area where we are active. So uh, what we do is we design and produce these devices, and we, uh, we are uh, adamant that we want to transmit the data safely and reliable to the cloud for, uh, for further processing. Now, to do that, we, we have created this whole value chain. So it starts with hardware. So we, we use IoT components to, uh, to build our products. And we have a whole range of uh, partners in uh, sourcing the components to uh, helping us building the products. We, uh, we engineer uh, the IoT devices. So in the engineering part, that's what we do uh, independently. So we're sourcing the components. We, we build the devices. Then we, uh, we produce, and uh, we have several production partners where the devices that we have designed are, are being built. Then we have uh, several uh, connectivity providers that we collaborate with, and of course, Deutsche Telekom is, is one of them. Uh, we send data to various different uh, platforms. Uh, most of the work actually we do with Amazon Web Ser Services, so that's where Sodak plays a role as well. Areas where we are not really uh, functioning uh, much in is the data analysis. So that is on the on the partner side, and that's when the customers come in. Uh, but we also have a front end dashboard uh, that uh, that people can use. But we we gladly also send the data to uh, to other dashboards like there are Cumulosity, uh, Thingsboard, etc. So this is a, a, a snapshot of uh, products that we're making. So on the right hand side, uh, we see our solar powered uh, trackers. We have uh, the blue thing in the top right corner is our air quality monitor, a device that we put on the handlebars of a bike when we cycle around to measure air quality. Um, we make several CO2 neutral components. Uh, that means that in the operation, uh, they're fully solar powered. There's no battery in these devices. So every, uh, the energy is stored in supercapacitors. So we have no uh, CO2 footprint when in operating. And, and we are known for our smart shipping labels, uh, ultra thin uh, narrowband IoT and LTM connected devices. And in the top left, you still see a snapshot of uh, actually the dashboard that we make to, uh, to show our data, the silica dashboard. 
Now, what I did is I took uh, the data that Jens provided us with uh, for narrowband IoT and LTM. These were two slides. So I overlaid the two slides and show you the country where uh, the roaming footprint uh, for, uh, for T-Mobile is present. Uh, red is the LTM one countries, blue is the narrowband countries, and purple is the country, the con are the countries where both of the technologies are available. Now, one of the first things that uh, becomes obvious is that uh, coverage in Latin America, Africa, and Asia is very, very limited still. And that is one, one of our biggest points of concern when we started with narrowband IoT and LTM some five years ago. The promise was LT, uh, LTM and narrowband will take over where the, the 2G has started. 2G is being phased out and narrowband IoT and LTM comes in. Now, five years down the road, uh, we've seen that it has really been deployed in, in North America and in Europe, but uh, so far very little in Africa and Latin America and Asia. And that is, that is for us one of the pain points. And the other thing that uh, you may notice is that uh, something that Jens already mentioned, if I zoom into the map, I see, for instance, Portugal, and it says Portugal is not in the roaming uh, footprint of T-Mobile. Well, that to me came a bit as a surprise because what you see here is the silica dashboard that shows uh, the, the travel that I did during my summer break. I took the camper van, I drove around through Europe, and I passed uh, through uh, Portugal for a couple of days. And you see all the green dots are data points that I've actually managed uh, to create using a T-Mobile uh, IoT device. So Portugal is present, although it's not on the map. And that's, that's exactly what Jan said, that sometimes the technology is available in the country uh, and there's no official roaming agreement, but roaming still works. Now, uh, another area is the uh, Czechia, Slo Slo Slovakia area. I put a box around it because that, that's where I went to. And you should expect, because the, the boxes are blue there, that there's full coverage. But what you see in here, in reality, oh, uh, sorry. In reality, you see that Slovakia is fully covered. Uh, so in the whole part that I traveled to, I had all these little data points. But if I look in the, the Czech Republic, you see that uh, for certain areas, there was no coverage. I was there, but no data points came in. The coverage was there in, in, in the Prague area, but in the rest of the country, I think it's not really existent yet. So. It doesn't mean that when a country is blue on one of these coverage maps, that indeed the whole country is covered. And that is, that is a work in progress. We see it improving all the time, but uh, this is something that you should be wary of. Uh, again, I said uh, Portugal was gray. South Africa was gray as well. Now, I happen to have been in, uh, in South Africa earlier this year in, in February. I did a tour and as you can see in all the data points here, again, this was with an IoT device with a T-Mobile SIM in there. I still had pretty good coverage all over South Africa. So again, another country that may surprise people uh, that coverage is available, but it still works. So we steered away from relying on the coverage maps that the, uh, the various different uh, operators or the GSMA uh, provides us. So what we created is our own coverage map. And every time a device communicates to, uh, to a cell, we put a little uh, dot on the map here. So it's a fully dynamic process. Uh, I must admit, we haven't been everywhere, but in the places where we've been, you see dots appearing on the map. So a couple of dots in Moscow, we haven't been much uh, else in, in, in Russia, and I don't think that's going to change in the short term. Uh, but also, like you can see, the Sweden, Norway, several places where we've been where actually the connectivity is there. And uh, it, 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 it's a growing map, and it, it's, it's really encouraging to see that in more and more places, indeed, the technology is available. Zooming a bit uh, further out on, the, on a higher level, you see that indeed South Africa, there's a lot of coverage uh, going on. Also some places in Latin, Latin America, as uh, Jens mentioned, red means that they are an uh, LTM and that in, in some of these countries, yes, the, the, there's no roaming agreement, but the, uh, the, the roaming still works because uh, the LTE technology is there. Again, still a lot of white uh, dots on, on the map. Uh, one of the points of concern is India, in the local Indian operator. Uh, claims to have roaming agreements with uh, the, the larger telcos, but all the devices that we sent uh, failed to work except for three messages in total that I managed to get uh, sent from India. So there's, there's still a long way to go. Now, going back to a slide that Jens uh, showed earlier on, uh, one of the concerning points to me is that we still have all these green countries on these maps here. So it, it seems to me that the telcos in these countries see narrowband IoT as a local technology and not so much as a roaming technology. If it's local, uh, I know, for instance, that the operator in India has rolled out a network of millions and millions of smart meters there, but doesn't allow us to, uh, to go there with our devices. So if the focus in narrowband IoT is 
uh, for the telcos being a local technology, yeah, we're not we're not going to win the battle as far as this uh, this this roaming is concerned, and that's that's what this uh, uh, presentation is all about. So, we thought if narrowband IoT and LTM is not are not available uh, globally, how about the traditional 4G? So, if we're looking at 4G and then particularly 4G Cat One, we see that the whole world map all of a sudden becomes green. There's a few countries in Africa that uh, still offer either 3G or 2G fallback and, and, and not the cat one that we're looking for, but the rest of the country is covered. So we, as a company, as a, as a development company, we started worrying, uh, haven't we been betting on the wrong technology? Shouldn't we have, uh, instead of using narrowband IoT LTM, so shouldn't we just have used LTE cat one as a technology to at least be able to, uh, to cover the whole world? So what we actually did is the, uh, the SODAC track that you see in the top here, we made a CAT1 version. It's just in, in prototype stage. So we, we're testing out uh, what the coverage is around the world. Um, so what we did is we, we sponsor, sponsored a, a young uh, couple of two 24-year-old uh, pilots that left from our local airfield here in Hilversum on a trip through Africa. And uh, we, we're dying to find out that all these uh, problematic countries that you see on the map here, uh, that whether they are being covered with, uh, with LTE CAT1 or not. It's, it's really excited. They, they, they only left a week ago, uh, but you can already see on the map that at the moment they are in, in Sudan. And so indeed we had coverage in their flight to Austria, the flight to Italy, the flight to Greece, several stops in Egypt. And now even from a very remote location like uh, Sudan, uh, the data is coming in and we're really uh, staying tuned. Uh, day after tomorrow, they fly to Kenya. So we can see if, if Kenya is on the coverage map. And uh, yeah, but I, I'm actually very positive by the results that we have so far. So maybe, and that might be a point of discussion, we still have half an hour for discussion. Uh, maybe uh, CAT1 is the technology and not so much narrowband IoT and LTEM. That's from my side. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot to both of you. I think it was a great, uh, great discussion. It was a great presentation. and. Now we do have a lot of questions that we can follow up and discuss. I will just uh, follow the timeline order and you can uh, respond to them, uh, both of you. So let's start with India. We discussed India. Is there any roaming options coming up for India? Um, I think the question goes to me. They're, they're not coming up. I'm pretty sure that there will be roaming in India, but uh, I would be lying uh, to say that they are uh, coming up in a few weeks' time or that we're working on this. As far as I do, as far as I know, we're not in, in current negotiations. Uh, we are in negotiations with many other operators in other countries, not with India as far as I know, but I'm sure it will come up at, at some point. Uh, but I wouldn't be able to tell you whether it's next year or the year after. Um, what Jan Willem said is a very important one. So when we come, um, when we really talk no nonsense here and are, um, are, are being really honest, like what are why why don't we have uh, roaming and all those with all those hundred operators in the world um, that have deployed NBRT or LTM? The reason is um, the P word, the protectionism word. There are several operators who ha who see, as Jan, Jan Willem put it. Uh, NBRT and LTM as local technologies. So they, they rolled out the network, they sell connectivity only to their local or national customers, and they don't want any foreign operator to um, to come into their country. This is uh, this is also sometimes just because they don't have international sales. So they don't, they, they can, they, they know that they can only sell, uh, uh, get wholesale revenues from inbound roaming, but they will not be able to sell any outbound roaming because their customers might not need it. And so that's, so, so which means that it's kind of an imbalanced situation, which doesn't make it easier for us. I think the, the only way to overcome this is to, um, if they understand that they have more to win than to lose. Of course, if, for example, an Indian operator opens a network for inbound roaming for people like Deutsche Telekom, they, they might lose a few customers, but on the other hand, they'll be able to address a much larger market. They will um, they will then may, um, maybe only get, I don't know, a certain fraction of the revenues per device that they will get if, 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 if it was their, were their own customer, but we will they will be able to get much more devices and much more customers in their country. And, but that's an individual decision, country by country. Uh, I think it's going to the right direction. But um, I think we all agree that IoT will only fly if it's a global thing. If, if we only have national deployments, national solutions, it will be extremely slow. 
so um, I'm positive, <laughs> but it, it still might might uh, uh, take some time. So if I uh, if, if you are an, an application device developer, I would uh, focus on Europe for now, and um, plus the uh, countries in which we do have uh, roaming outside of Europe. But don't expect countries like India to to be part of our roaming footprint in the short term. Please, I'm I'm happy to be proven wrong. Maybe the situation's different in a few months' time. Maybe somebody from, <laughs> from one of the operators is listening. And that's a that's a very similar that's a very similar um, question. If I can just answer this, because it's um, it's 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 um, it's really similar. Uh, when do you think more Asian and African countries will roll at NVRT? So uh, the, the before um, so I was talking about the second step actually uh, first. The, the first step is to to make the decision to invest into an NVRT and LTM network. I think it's a chicken and egg thing. In uh, like five, six years ago, several operators in the world, in Asia and in Europe mostly, decided to roll out NVRT, not because there was so much demand, but, but there was so much demand projected and expected from us. So we needed to do this. And now there's a an, an developer community um, and an ecosystem coming up. <clears throat> and and now, now the demand has more, um, subs, uh, I'll say, um, materialized. So it's a chicken and egg thing. I think if uh, it turns out that uh, in, in Europe and Asia, NDRT is very successful and there are big deployment and good devices, and then more and more countries in Asia as well as, as in Africa will, uh, will be able to create a positive business case for them to, to open the network. Plus, um, I, I think it's fair to say that the deployment of uh, NBRT and especially of LTM is much cheaper than it was six, seven years ago, because now with 5G, everything is converging, the whole uh, kit, the whole equipment gets gets cheaper, it gets, um, gets virtualized, um, cloudified, so um, I think that the, the investments will, will, the required investments will be reduced. Oh yeah, we are getting there, hopefully. Actually, there is one more question. I would say the answer would be similar. What about the roaming in Middle East, Saudi Arabia, and United Arab Emirates? Yeah, same thing as for India. We do we are in mm -hmm. touch with those operators, but it always depends. It doesn't. It doesn't only depend on Deutsche Telekom. We do yeah. what we can, but if uh, the respective operator has no interest and no business drive. Uh, to to finish the the roaming testing or start the roaming testing and finish the roaming agreement with us, then it doesn't make sense. So uh, I think there are a few operators in in in, in Arabia, Arabian Middle East region where we are in the progress, but I can't co uh, disclose who they are. But um, it will so it will be slowly, but there will be some additions coming. Yeah. Thank you for your answers. And I believe we are true uh, about this roaming topic for outside of Europe. But actually, there is another question. Uh, how about the network coverage in Europe for LTM and NBIOT? Can you say that? Uh, is it fully covered? Or can you say that there are still things? Uh, to do? I think it depends from country to country. Uh, Jan Willem, please correct me. I think in the Netherlands, uh, you've got the best network. <laughs> As always. Um, not, 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 not only because the Netherlands are the smart, the, the Dutch people are the smartest in Europe, but it's also because it's a very densely populated uh, country with very lots of L LTE base stations. I think we, I think we all know that f uh, for NDRT and LTM, no extra base stations will ever be built. But uh, it's about the LTE base stations being activated for LTM and NDRT. So in the Netherlands, it's great. In Germany, it's and, and in Austria, it's it's pretty good, and some other countries, it's pretty good. There are some countries with a with a less dense uh, deployment. Uh, things, for example, France or or Britain, um, is currently less dense. There are some countries, uh, for example, uh, Czech Republic or or Hungary, where not where it's less dense than and or, or not all the regions are very well covered like we like in, in the Netherlands, but it's it's gradually um, it's gradually coming. Yeah, maybe to add to it, if you, you just mentioned France, uh, typically we see that the coverage in France is uh, is pretty good. Uh, although in France, we, we basically only see LTM in, in a very few uh, probably testing spots. We see narrowband IoT, but it means that if you want to deploy something in France, you should aim for uh, LTM. 
uh, for Italy, it's the opposite. Uh, Italy uh, uh, originally only had uh, narrowband IoT. We've seen over the last two, three months that also some uh, LTM uh, deployments uh, have been done there. Uh, yeah, I, I mentioned Portugal. That, that question was was asked to. In Portugal, we only managed to connect over uh, LTM, so not not a narrowband IoT. So it varies a bit from country to country. But typically, we can say that uh, if if you are building a solution that needs to work in Europe, then uh, choose a module that supports narrowband IoT and LTM, and then you're fine. Mm -hmm. Thank you for both for your answers. And actually, a very interesting to another very interesting topic is this Cat1 over Cat M1 uh, topic. So uh, there is a question uh, for for Jens. Can you wait a second? Yeah. Uh, what do you think of Cat1? Do you agree with Jan Willem about the Cat1? Uh, and I'm, I'm not. Being I, can't, the I can't recall what. Uh, what can can you repeat your statement on cat one uh, before i agree or disagree uh, jan willem maybe yeah so so what i said is with, because cat one is uh, basically uh, roaming and on the same networks as where my mobile phone is roaming it mm -hmm. means that that if i phone coverage i have cat one coverage so from my mm -hmm. perspective i say cat one is a brilliant solution if you want to have global coverage uh, the penalties that you you need to pay there are that the, the module is a bit more expensive uh, it could be as as, as much as, as twice the price just for the communication module and the other penalty is the higher power consumption it uses a bit more power than that the uh, uh, narrowband iot and ltm uh, technology uses so so there is a trade-off but if your main focus is uh, global usage of your let's say tracking device for me it's a no-brainer and we should go for cat one but i hope uh, to see what your opinion is on this yeah, I think it's similar. Um, there's no one technology that's perfect for every use case. So I see it as a continuum. I don't have a slide at, uh, at hand, but um, I think you've seen similar slides. So you have the two extremes, it's NVRT and uh, 5G new radio. So NVRT is for the cheapest devices with less, less powerful, but most energy efficient that can last for years. And you've got 5G new radio devices that are super powerful, and um, but also super expensive and super energy consuming. And then in the middle, you've got LTM, which is close to NVRT and uh, uh, LTE, uh, CAT4 and others. And then maybe CAT1 just in the middle between regular LTE and LTM. And as Jan Willem said, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a trade-off. You pay more. Um, you, usually the power saving features for LTM don't work for CAT1. Um, depends on the use case. If you have a use case that doesn't where we are happy with, with um, a higher bill of materials and more um, more energy consumption, or even even um, like a like, like a wired energy source, then then Cat One might be a good choice. Yeah, I think it is good to compare them and pick according to the use case. And actually, there is a question about the Cat One Bis. Uh, is <laughs> Cat One Bis a credible IoT solution from a roaming perspective? anyone has a... yeah shall i step in there um what what uh, uh, cat, cat one beast was a newly introduced term i think it was only introduced one or two years ago the difference between full fledged cat one and cat one beast is that cat one is a full duplex technology so you can send and receive at the same time which is essential for let's say voice communication uh, while the cat one beast is half duplex so you either send or you receive because it's half duplex, your component count goes down. So Cat1 Beast modules are significantly cheaper than the Cat1 modules. So it's bridging the gap uh, a bit between narrowband IT LTM and Cat1 by just uh, implementing this uh, Cat1 Beast uh, techno technology. And yes, we are excited about Cat1 Beast because we've seen already module manufacturers that are coming really, really close to the, the, the with the Cat1 Beast device to uh, narrowband IT and LTM devices. But there's still, a, um, without going into too much details, there's still a question mark regarding spectrum efficiency. For um, but that's that's maybe not your problem, but that's a problem of of network operators to uh, who want to make sure that the UX, coming back to the user experience, um, is is very good and that that a cell can support um, several uh, thousands of IoT devices in parallel. Maybe I can throw one throw in one more thing into the discussion. I would like to know Jens how you uh, feel about that. Uh, one of the reasons why operators in, in, let's say, particularly the poorer countries don't de deploy LTM is because they need to sacrifice spectrum. Uh, to run LTM, you have to sacrifice four mm -hmm. resource blocks mm -hmm. to, to offer the technology. 
if you mm -hmm. offer, offer cat one or uh, support cat one bs it means that you don't sacrifice any spectrum you you enable the whole spectrum for both voice and iot and if if you don't have any iot users all the spectrum goes to uh, to voice and the other way around so so mm -hmm. from uh, from their point of view i can truly understand that these operators would rather make you use uh, uh, cat one than use uh, lt yeah but but let's be honest cat one will not be able to replace nvrt and ltm and and so that's one thing yeah so uh, cat one will never be able to do the trick or even cat one bis will never be able to do the trick and um, enable such use cases that are allowed by um, NVRT and perhaps also LTM. And secondly, uh, if I think if we if we look at operators who haven't deployed NVRT and LTM yet, those are typically not operators who have a huge IoT business based on CAD1. Those are typically operators that don't have IoT business. So I think IoT is definitely, and I, uh, sorry, CAD1 and CAD1 biz is definitely uh, like a piece in the puzzle, makes complete sense, but it will not will only be able to cater for several use cases, not not for all of them. So for, from an operator perspective, I, I will still recommend any operator to deploy both NBRT and LTM. Um, I would say one more uh, follow-up question about the CAD1 and CAD1 biz. Aren't they going to deliver the same sort of in-building or underground penetration are nope. they not? I think the, the, the good thanks for the good question. Uh, we we forgot to mention so the the downsides the the down how say downsides of of cat one cat one bis is the three things device costs power saving features or energy consumption and uh, indoor penetration. Yeah, thank you. So questions are a lot and a lot of from various areas. So I try to bring them together. Uh, and now I want to switch to actually eSIM topic. We have a couple of questions on eSIM and we will also have a session on eSIM on Thursday morning. So uh, we can also deep dive into eSIM there, but this they are mainly for eSIM for roaming topic. So maybe a bit towards to you, Jens. So is eSIM mandatory for NBRT and LTM roaming? Do we need eSIM? No, um, so eSIM um, unfortunately can mean two things. It can mean um, embedded SIM or um, machine form factor. <laughs> okay, this, this of course, uh, the, doesn't doesn't matter at all, but also you don't need EU ICC. So usually when you get a regular SIM card, whatever form factor from from us or from any other operator, it will roam just like a mobile phone. It will roam in all the countries where the mobile operator has roaming agreements with. And um, so LTM and BRT roaming is um, within Europe. It's it's free as of uh, there's there are no extra roaming charges within Europe. Typically, there, there might be some operators who who have separate separate charges, but for Deutsche Telekom and other operators that I know, um, it's it's it uh, the, the the tariff applies to your home country as well as other European countries. Yeah, exactly. And actually, a similar question is how do you handle IoT roaming in countries that don't allow eSIM or don't allow permanent roaming? Example, KSA. Yeah. Um, I mean, ESIM, um, as far as I know, any country would, would allow ESIM, but, but it's true that in some countries like uh, India or Brazil or China, uh, permanent roaming is not allowed. And, um, and But the question is like, what extent are we talking about and what do we mean by permanent roaming and are those um, regulators interested in NBRT and LTM? But for, in those cases, uh, what we, what we do is we will have uh, not for NBRT though we have uh, but for for automotive customers we have local agreements and local MZ so local SIM profiles. Yeah, thank you for your answers and I guess we are also true with the eSIM questions and uh, some more generic que generic questions around NBRT and LTM. So yes, is the NBRT and LTM roaming free when it happens? Yeah, that's what I meant. It's, uh, uh, we, we, it, it's like for it's like for a mobile phone. If you, for example, if you are a customer in I don't know um, Poland and you buy a or uh, Austria and you buy a uh, uh, SIM card or a data tariff plan from from Deutsche Telekom, it will work in your home country and in other European countries. But of course, there are country zones. So uh, if you want the, the device to roam in the US, it will be a different price, or in Canada, it will be a different price. And then Australia or South Africa will be a different country zone. Yeah, 
but we will have like, I don't know, five different uh, country, uh, world zones. And, but Europe is the central zone. So for Europe, you don't need to pay extra. Yeah, I guess it's similar to the other networks, the mm -hmm. uh, pricing model. Um, okay, I have a couple of questions to Jan Millem about the coverage map and the coverage in general. So you show this coverage map of Sodak Jan Millem. Is it publicly available or can it be shared with interested parties? Um, if people send me a message, uh, we can negotiate uh, whether we can share it with them. The, the point is that there's still a, a few uh, flaws because this was made for uh, internal use only. Uh, so that's why we don't want to go uh, public with it. But if people have, have specific uh, things that they want to discuss, they should send me a private message. Yeah, you all have his contact, so you can contact Jan Willem if, if this is related. Uh, actually, the second question, the other question is also, I would like to ask that to you because you experience it. So can a SIM card from T-Mobile be used for roaming on narrowband IoT networks? So a SIM card that you get in Netherlands from T-Mobile or in another country, you can, you, do you use the same SIM cards? Yeah, so, so that, that is a question that we often hear. Can you go out to the local phone shop, get yourself a uh, prepaid SIM card of T-Mobile, put it in an IoT device, and can it work on narrowband IoT? Unfortunately not. Uh, the, this in, in the only place in the world that I've been to where it works that way is in South Africa. So indeed, in South Africa, you can go to the phone shop, get yourself a card, put it in, an, in a device, and it communicates. In the rest of the world, the, the contracts for narrowband IoT and LTM are separate from what you, you get on your normal SIM card. Um, yeah, but actually, with uh, to create a SIM card, you could uh, use the same SIM card and you could roam uh, in every country that we have the... Uh, we have the roaming agreement too, so maybe it's also depending on the provider. Okay, so I would like to talk a bit about the data sizes a bit in the IoT and LTM. And there I see a couple of questions on that area. So what is the definition of too much data for in IoT and LTM? So how do we define uh, it? And is it regulated by the MNOs uh, or is it regulated like by, by GSMA and there's like a common regulation. So let's talk a bit about the data sizes. Okay, shall I start? Yeah, please. So the first thing, um, and, and I, I think the only thing that we really regulate is the monthly data consumption. So uh, if, you, if you have a contract with us, you know, there's a monthly data consumption allowance for you. Usually, uh, it's not needed. So uh, in I know one tariff where we offer actually 6.5 megabytes per NBOT device per month. I know that um, from, if I look at the roaming reports that we get that most uh, other devices in uh, on average consume around 200 kilobytes per, per month. So we're really doing well here and we have no problem. The NBOT network has been designed and I can't really give you figures. It has been designed for a particular, um, uh, how to say, cadence or, or number of transmissions per day with a, with a certain payload size, and uh, and so on. Um, but so roughly, we we will, we will, we always uh, expect that devices will not consume more than 500 kilobytes, perhaps one megabyte per month. That's for NBLT. For LTM, we don't have so many restrictions. For LTM, our customers, uh, most customers also use other data plans. They don't use uh, like a 6.5 megabyte data plan, they, they use a 100 megabyte or 50 megabyte data plan. So there are not much restrictions. What, are, what we're most nervous is devices who send a lot of data within like one minute or, or one hour. Um, we don't, we, we, in our terms and conditions, when you, when, you are, when, you, when you buy connectivity from us, it says that you need to stick to the Deutsche Telekom IoT uh, developer or application guidelines. And this is also, um, if you come back, go back to the links that, that I've distributed, it's, they're also available at the Deutsche Telekom website or IoT, I think IoT creators and as well as IoT solution optimizer. And they, they, those documents are extremely helpful for, for developers, not only to, to play by the rules and, and, um, and uh, not get into trouble with Deutsche Telekom, but also to make sure that your application works really well. And those telecom guidelines are a deviation or derivation of the GSMA TS34 document. So um, it's, it's all in line, um, but, but it's not as strict. So we won't cut off a device that, um, 
that sends too much data. Uh, if it turns out that there are that, that there are network problems, we might do, have to do this. But in general, uh, most developers are reasonable and stick to the guidelines. As long as there is no harm. I to hope this answers right? your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so, so too. Uh, I just want to switch quickly since you mentioned the IoT solution optimizer. So how can people get access to that? Yen? Go to the link, subscribe. <laughs> use it. Yeah. Yeah, I will after the webinar when I'm sending the recording, I can also send you the mm. link to subscribe to IoT Solution Optimizer and you can mm. you can test that. Um, okay, continuing with the questions around uh, roaming. So another question is, is it possible for roaming to choose the best network instead of preferred list on the SIM cards? So can we pick our network provider, for example? No, oh, the SIM cards uh, or the, the yeah, device is steered by the preferred providers list on the SIM card, which is a which is a um, an order which which true ob um, obviously is based on the commercial conditions of Deutsche Telekom. For example, if we have uh, if we have roaming agreements with two operators in one country, um, we might have different conditions. So one operator, one roaming partner will might be more expensive than the other one. So we of course try to steer our customers' devices to the cheaper roaming operator. This is what every operator does. But if if needed, if there is a specific, yeah, specific you can need, use, reason, yeah, can of course, force, yeah, yeah. Force and I mean, pick the preferred operator. Um, that does not work in general. I think there are some tricks. But I'm not here to to disclose tricks, and I don't know exactly how it works. Yeah, maybe but, in a commercial uh, level you cannot, uh, but like in a as a developer you can just uh, push the connection to a certain cell tower and a certain network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah. So, but, but, it, but the way it works is the devices looks, uh, or a device, uh, if it's in a new network, it looks for the preferred provider. If it cannot reach the preferred provider, it will go to the second one on the list. If it doesn't reach them, it will go to the third one on the list. So I don't see a reason why a developer would prefer one particular network in the country. I think the developer should always say that the, the device should should connect to the to the uh, to any available network, as long as if it's available. Yeah, exactly. we're not, we're not talking about video telephony here, where you are you might be restricted. We're, we're talking about sending very little data. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we still have quite a lot of questions. I hope you're not tired and we have seven minutes left. We need to end this meeting at five o'clock sharp. So this question I would like to ask the both of you. Uh, what is the difference in terms of performance and prioritize, prioritization bit of roaming between two carriers and switching between two carrier profiles using remote SIM provisioning? So, so the first one is, is roaming. It's really easy. It's re really fast. And the second one is a bit more complicated and, uh, and also more costly for, for you. I, I mean, e -SIM for, so, so eSIM as of EUICC is not available for NDLT at the moment because it, it requires SMS and it's, extreme, it's very um, expensive for, for developers. And um, so it's, it's actually... I would say not needed so far. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, so maybe let's talk about the feature of these technologies. And uh, we heard that you also mentioned that yes, that two G and three G will be terminated soon. Uh, but is the current low power by the real network coverage wide enough to cover those sunsetting technologies? I think it's a great question. Or yeah, the, the, the yeah, so so basically, what uh, what we already identified on on uh, looking at uh, particularly the coverage map that uh, that we from Sodak was shown, is that uh, in in most Western European countries, um, the the technology uh, of narrowband IoT and LTM is more than sufficient to take over all the two G three G uh, traffic. In fact, it's way more efficient. Uh, we can have way um, um, more devices using these technologies than we could with uh, with the 2G and 3G. And you see that um, the, the sunsetting process comes in two parts. It, it, it's, it's the available spectrum of the 2G is going down. So the number of devices that can actually be supported is, is going down uh, before they, they are totally being shut off. And uh, I, I think uh, it, it, in some countries it, it, it's happening much faster than most people uh, 
see uh, uh, happening. So, so we introduced the, the term here of the uh, the new millennium bug. So uh, mm -hmm. all these devices that are out there that are running 2G, 3G, uh, networks are being switched off and all of a sudden you look, hey, my device doesn't work anymore. So, so we always recommend people to be ready for it. Uh, look at all these old 2G, 3G uh, uh, solution and, and start making a plan uh, implementing and replacing it with uh, with an LPWA technology. Yeah, thanks a lot for your answer. Uh, okay, but a couple of quick last questions. Uh, is it possible to bind end devices with each other and devices with each other in narrowband IoT and LTEM? I guess not, the answer not, is not, not via <laughs> NVLT and LTEM. NVLT and LTEM are cellular technologies going to the next base station. If you want a couple um, or peer device, you would need to use Bluetooth, for example, but then you would have extra device cost and extra energy. Yeah, uh, thank you. And another parallel question, I would say, will you turn on EC mode B on LTM? Will you, I guess is for you, Jens. <laughs> will you do that in yeah, um, I'm not not sure if we have an official in Germany would say Sprachregelung, like an official uh, corporate statement here, but I think I, I can I can disclose it without being shot. We don't we have no plans to turn on uh, mode B on LTM. Um, it, it used to be um, it, it's one of those features that have been designed seven years ago, around roughly, and um, it, ha it have, has been deemed as not necessary by the operator community. And this is also reflected in the GSMA deployment guide. So from all the discussions we also had with other base, we don't know if any operator used it. So the sh short question, short answer is nope. Thank you for your short answer. Uh, and then another question to you, Jens. How long do operators allow devices to roam on their network? Is there a time limit? Because uh, the person heard that sometimes operators drop devices after 30 days of roaming in their territory. Do you have? Or Jan Willem, do you have this kind of an experience? Well, this is a country to country uh, difference. So what we see particularly in, uh, let's say, Latin America, but even in the United States, uh, in, in some countries, permanent roaming is not allowed. So what, what you say here is the difference between temporary and permanent roaming. And the, the cutoff point for some countries could be a week, and in other countries, it could be uh, 30 days or maybe even three months. And some countries don't care. You can you can always roam. So, like I said, varies from country to. And just to be specific, here in Europe, the only country which is half in Europe which doesn't allow permanent roaming is Turkey. All the other European countries have no problems with that. This breaks my heart. Sorry, but... transit. Sorry. <laughs> No problem. I hope they will fix that. Uh, one last question to Jan Willem. I think he needs to drop out very soon. And I think it's a great question for you, Jan. Uh, for vehicle tracking and fleet management, what is the best fit in BIoT, LTM, or CAT1? Yeah, so what uh, people always say is that narrowband IoT doesn't uh, support a, a transparent handover from cell to cell. So basically, if, if you go from, from one cell to the next cell, you have to reattach to, uh, to it. Uh, it, it, it. Many people see that as a blocker for, uh, for tracking. In, in our opinion, it's not. Uh, you could just as well use narrowband IoT as LTM for, uh, for a tracking solution. It's more important, is the technology available and widely supported in the country uh, where you're doing it? Yeah, because in NBA, exactly. Um... I agree, uh, because an NVLT tracker wouldn't send the position every minute or every 10 seconds, so it doesn't matter if it, if it sends the, the position once an hour, it has more than enough time to reattach to the next network. Yeah, thank you so much for both of you for your answers. A couple of questions left, but I think we need to uh, stop this session right now. Uh, I already took so much of your time, but I think it was a great session and great discussion at the end with the questions. So thanks everyone for your questions. Please contact me via email uh, if you want to follow up with the questions and I will find you the answers. Uh, and rather than that, thanks thanks Jan Willem and Jens for, for great, great information that you provided. And hope to see everyone tomorrow in tomorrow's session where we'll, we will talk about uh, success and failure stories with NBIT and LTEM, also from Sodex perspective, which will be a quite interesting session. Thank you. Thank Have you. Have a nice Thank day, you. everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.